What is an evangelical Christian? You might think you know the answer to that, but my guest on Good God today is Tony Campolo. He wants you to think about it a little differently. I'm George Mason. Stay tuned. Welcome to Good God, conversations that matter about faith and public life. I'm George Mason, the host, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome to the program today, Tony Campolo. Tony, we're glad to have you. I'm glad to be here. Wonderful. Now, for those uh, who don't know Tony uh, or his writings, many books, 20-some books that you publish, is that More right? More than that. More yeah. than that. Oh, my I goodness. I don't have yeah. an unpublished thought. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, Tony is a retired sociology professor, um, retired from Eastern College uh, in Pennsylvania, Philadelphia area, and has uh, taught a generation of so sociology students, but also all this time has been a Baptist preacher and evangelical and has been very influential in the evangelical world. And I think it's uh, uh, really important for people to understand and to situate, uh, Tony, your understanding and take on uh, the American church, uh, evangelicalism, since you've been so much a part of it, and what's been moving and changing, and, and what are some of the seismic shifts you're seeing in all of this? So tell us how you began to identify as an evangelical, uh, first of all, and how you began to be known and, and, and to participate in this, in this world? Most people like Ron Sider and uh, uh, Jim Wallace and myself mm -hmm. um, who are considered the progressives. Yes. All started by uh, coming into a Christian experience in some fundamentalist church. Yes. You know, they sing 50 verses of Just As I Am, right, right. come down the aisle and make a commitment. And that's where you start. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one thing I will say about my wonderful fundamentalist background, and I'm grateful for it, is they got me into the Bible. Okay. Uh, fundamentalists do a good job on that. Those mm -hmm. who are moderates don't do as good a job right. as fundamentalists in terms of getting you to read the scriptures, mm -hmm. study what's in the book, know chapters and verses. The more I read the Bible, the more I disagreed with the political agenda mm -hmm. of fundamentalism. Mm -hmm. um, I had no problems with believing in the doctrines of the Apostles' Creed, mm -hmm. no problem accepting the authority of Scripture, but I did have a problem with the fact that fundamentalism over the years has become more and more captive to a political party, mm -hmm. uh, particularly the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. There's nothing wrong with being a Republican any more than there's something wrong with being a Democrat. But when you make a political party a religious thing mm -hmm. and say, if you're not in this party, then you're not a Christian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I get that. Mm -hmm. I got a lot of people who thought, if you're not a Republican, I question your credentials as a Christian. Right. Began to worry about that. Mm -hmm. There were a lot of things that changed my mind. Mm -hmm. I'm an old guy. so. I was coming of age during Martin Luther King's day and mm -hmm. during the civil rights era and at the same time the anti-war movement. Right. And here were the evangelicals suddenly behind the war mm -hmm. and seemingly supportive of racial segregation. I just couldn't see how you could believe the Bible mm -hmm. and support that sort of thing. It was my biblical commitments that challenged the political ideology that was emerging in uh, the evangelical community. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of it made me a persona non grata in some circles. However, what I did find was that young people who were evangelicals were flocking to me and flocking to Ron Sider and to Jim Wallace, feeling the same way. Mm -hmm. We love the biblical truths. We love the doctrines of the Apostles' Creed. We, we talk about having a personal relationship with the resurrected Jesus. But how can you support segregation? How can you be opposed to Martin Luther King? How can you support a war that's killing innocent people mm -hmm. that has no validity whatsoever? So that's what changed us 
and moved us out of uh, the evangelical camp. You say, well, how does politics? That's my problem. Yeah. Too often evangelicalism defines itself politically yes. instead of biblically. So it does seem that today people who have identified as evangelicals are, are, are struggling to figure out whether they want to maintain that identification or let the word go altogether. Yeah. Uh, whether they want to try to reclaim it in some sense or, or simply say, that's not my tribe anymore. Yeah. Uh, where do you stand on that? Well, it's interesting that you should bring this up because just last weekend, uh, a group of us, about 50, mm -hmm. met in Chicago mm -hmm. to re revisit what was called the Chicago Declaration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 45 years ago, leading evangelicals brought together by the likes of Carl Henry yeah. and uh, Billy Graham came together mm -hmm. to say, uh, wait a minute, evangelicalism has lost its social conscience. Mm -hmm. It's no longer committed to social justice. Mm -hmm. We've got to change that. Mm -hmm. and they put out the Chicago Declaration. We revisited it, and it was interesting to watch the discussion because what came up was just what you said. Ron Sider said, we've got to reclaim the name evangelical. Most of us said it can't be done. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a sociologist. I know that the meaning of a word is defined by its general usage mm -hmm. in the society. Yes. The word evangelical, whether you like it or not, in the popular mind outside of the church, right. has these characteristics. You say evangelical at Harvard, mm -hmm. they say, oh, you're anti-gay, you're anti-women, mm -hmm. uh, you're anti-immigrant, mm -hmm. uh, you, uh, you, you don't believe in climate change, right. uh, you are pro-gun. And they go down this list of things, and we say, wait a minute, that's not who we are. Right. That's not who we are. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, you're an evangelical. That's what evangelicals believe, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And my response to that is a simple statement. Some evangelicals believe that. When you come up with this figure, 81% of white evangelicals voted for Donald Trump. Nothing wrong with voting one way or the other. We're not here to tell people how to vote. We are here to say when 81% of white evangelicals vote for Donald Trump, it says something about who white evangelicals are. Mm -hmm. Now, notice I kept on saying white yes. evangelicals. Right. African-American, black evangelicals did right. not vote that way, right. nor did Hispanic right. uh, vote that way. Mm -hmm. and we have this generalization to act like white people own America. Yes. And uh, the reality is they don't anymore. Right. Uh, the great white evangelical America is coming to an end. We are so diverse now mm -hmm. that we can't say that any more that this is the quote unquote an evangelical nation. So uh, some of us uh, together said we've got to come up with a new name. Mm -hmm. Coming up with a new name is, is not an unusual thing. I'm old enough to remember when I was a boy calling yourself a fundamentalist mm -hmm. was a reasonable and proper thing to do. Really? Mm. But the word fundamentalist gathered all kinds of negative baggage. Right. Uh, fundamentalist uh, came to mean anti-intellectual. Right. After the famous Scopes trial right. in Tennessee right. on evolution, right. anti-intellectual. Secondly, they said pietistic. I remember mm -hmm. as a kid, we used to have these little ditties, we don't dance and we don't smoke and we don't chew and we don't date the girls who do. You right, know? right. And we had these little rules and regulations and it became very legalistic. Yes. So anti-intellectual, legalistic. I mean, we just didn't like the word anymore. Right. And so uh, uh, Billy Graham and Carl Henry, the editor of Christianity Today magazine, got together and said, let's not call ourselves fundamentalists anymore. Let's call ourselves evangelicals. Mm -hmm. And so the word fundamentalist was dropped. So a Jerry Falwell would not have called himself a fundamentalist. Right. He would call himself an evangelical. We got rid of the old word because it had too much negative meaning. Yes. We've now come to the fake place where we think that the word evangelical mm -hmm. has so much negative baggage right. that we needed a new term. So Jim Wallace, 
um, the editor of um, Sojourners Magazine, called us together in Washington. There were about 25 of us and said, can we come up with a new name? Jim's assistant said, Jim, you were, you were being interviewed by a secular Jewish country and Western disc jockey in uh, Nashville, Tennessee. We referred to you and those of your ilk, like Tony Campolo and Ron Sapp, as being into the red letters of the Bible. Uh-huh. And the old Bibles have right. the words of Jesus highlighted in red. Right, right. You're into the red letters of the Bible. Right. We said, that's it. Let's start calling ourselves Red Letter Christians. Okay. So we're trying to promote a new title. Okay. All right. And it's Red Letter Christians. Well, I think we want to pursue that a little more. But I think for many people who are viewing this or listening, uh, it might be confusing because traditionally we've we've talked about denominations in uh, Christianity. And so I think people think about the Roman Catholic Church, and then they think of Lutherans and, and, and Presbyterians and Baptists and Methodists and, and the like. Uh, but when we talk about evangelicals, we're actually talking about a, a kind of um, informal movement that, that encompasses all of these and not all of these, that it, it cuts across denominational lines, and there's really no uh, institutional leadership to it. it. It becomes much more of an informal way of talking about a kind of way of looking at the faith and looking at the world. So you mentioned Billy Graham and Carl Henry, uh, these sorts of folks. Uh, it, 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 left, it left this brand of Christianity open to personalities, didn't it? To, to people who would start magazines or who would have television programs or crusades or revivals or whatever the case may be. And, and so you, you collected a kind of renown in the public square and people would say, oh, that's what an evangelical is. Uh, because we really didn't have a place, we didn't have Canterbury to go to. We didn't have Rome to go to. We didn't have these places where we could sort of say, this is actually what it means to be this. And, and, and that's both a, a very American sort of uh, a democratic way of thinking of religion. And also, uh, so there's, there's a strength to that, but it's also a weakness, isn't it? Yes. Uh, you summed it up with one simple line. It's very confusing right now. Yes. Uh, when somebody says, quote unquote, I'm a Baptist. Right. You really don't know anything about the person. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> you yes. don't know whether uh, he's, his theology is such that he believes in the inerrancy of Scripture. Right. Because there are Baptists who believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. There are right. other Baptists who say, no, we think that Scripture uh, has to be interpreted as an ancient book. Right. Uh, that uh, needs to be uh, understood historically. And, you know. Yeah. All kinds of views of scripture. Right. When you say you're Baptist, all kinds of views on crucial issues of our time. Absolutely. Gay marriage. Right. You can find Baptists who say we support gay marriage. Baptists right. who say we're opposed to gay marriage. Right. Um, so, and if somebody says I'm Episcopalian, it, there was you, a, you don't know anymore. Yeah. What, what does that mean? On which side do you fall yeah. about these things? Yes. I, uh, I, just this morning I was at breakfast and there was an Episcopalian bishop there. Yeah. And he came over and said hello. And I said, oh. Hi, you're Tony Campbell. I said, yeah. He said, I want you to know that I identify with what you as a Baptist believe more than I identify with my Episcopalian theology. Oh, my goodness. Whoa. Isn't that interesting? What does interesting? it mean to be an Episcopalian when a bishop talks like this? Yes, yes. So uh, I don't know where things are right now. Right. Generally, when a family moves into a neighborhood uh, mm -hmm. where they're strangers, Right. and they start looking for a church, they may have come from a Presbyterian church. And chances are that's the first church they'll try. Mm -hmm. But they'll try about four or five churches right. until they find one where they feel at home with the preaching, with the theology, with the politics of the place. Not with the name on the outside right. of the, the building. Yeah, yeah right. And so, right. Uh, and of course, one of the things that has happened is the growth of the mega churches in yes. this country have no denominational labels whatsoever. Well, let's pick that up after the break. I want to uh, talk about the non denominational factor with evangelicalism also, and then talk a little more about the red letter Christian movement. Okay. All right. Thanks, Tony. Good 
God salutes the vital services provided to our community by the North Texas Food Bank. Each day, the North Texas Food Bank Feeding Network provides access to more than 190,000 meals for hungry children, seniors, and families. Visit ntfb.org to get involved. We're back with Tony Campolo, and Tony, we were just talking before the break about the non-denominational movement, uh, many of which uh, involve megachurches, really huge congregations throughout the country that don't identify with a particular denomination. Uh, it is interesting to me, though, that when you look at these non-denominational churches, very often they have a kind of denominational background to them anyway. They, they actually might be Baptist, yeah. but they don't really uh, put the name out there. Or they may be Bible churches uh, and, and, and identify more with the tradition that comes out of Dallas Theological Seminary or Moody Bible Institute or something like that. Uh, but a lot of people, as you say, uh, like the idea that there's not a denominational label there, uh, and yet um, that really doesn't account for who they are. Uh, it, 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 there's a kind of negative aspect of we're not that, but we are this. And what is the this in this evangelical megachurch movement? Well, that's a, that's yes. a tough question to answer. Yeah. Uh, let me say that... Um, uh, I spoke at the largest United Methodist Church in mm -hmm. America. Ah, Kansas City. Is that right? Well, actually, it's just outside of Dayton. Ohio oh, oh is it there? Okay, yeah, okay. I thought it was the other one. like wildfire. Okay, all right. Uh, I got to the church, and I was amazed that the billboard had the name of the church, but not the denominational affiliation. Uh -huh. Okay. And down at the bottom, in very small print, it yeah. said, a United Methodist Church. Right. A kind of an afterthought. Mm -hmm. In other words, uh, many uh, pastors are finding denominational labels mm -hmm. are a turnoff. Yes. Let me just point to your church. Yes. You're a pastor of a very prominent uh, Baptist church. Mm -hmm. um, how many of your members came from other denominations. Quite a few. Yeah, quite uh, a few. You see, right. so they came and they liked the worship. I mm -hmm. mean, you have a fantastic worship service. Thank you. May yes. I give you a plug? <laughs> Thank you. The music was stellar. Thank you. Uh, the, there was dignity. There was just a lovely, lovely presentation. Thank you. And both the youth choir and the regular choir blew me away. Yes. You had this uh, uh, celloist that did a Bach piece. That, I know. Oh, it was magnificent. Right. People come and say, you know, I feel at home here, right. and I'm Episcopalian, but this church right. has what I'm looking for. So uh, it was Will Williman, perhaps the most prominent preacher in the Methodist tradition, right. who said to me, the last person who joined a denominational church did so, I believe, somewhere around 1960. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, I mean this, that people still join Baptist churches or Methodist churches or Presbyterian churches, but they don't join them because of the label on the denomination. Right. They join them because they uh, identify with the worship and the preaching mm -hmm. and the values of the church. Mm -hmm. uh, denominational labels have lost their meaning. Right. That's the 21st century. And of course, the mega churches have come into play. play and. Uh, they generally are suburban churches. Yes. Very few, there are a few, but very few mega churches mm -hmm. exist in the center of cities. Right. They're in suburbs, uh, people move in from all kinds of backgrounds. And what the mega church offers in the midst of this uh, anonymous suburban mm -hmm. setting mm -hmm. is a place where people can establish a sense of community. Mm -hmm. uh, you go to these mega churches, you can't believe all the stuff they have going. I was at the most famous of the uh, mega churches, Willow Creek. Yes. They have a garage where you can get your automobile repaired with expert mechanics. They have a dental clinic. They have a medical clinic. Mm -hmm. uh, they do all kinds of things for poor people throughout the city of Chicago. Uh, they have all kinds of programs uh, you name it, they have mm -hmm. one for it, from exercise mm -hmm. uh, f for people who need to get in shape 
you name it. And this sense of community that is built up in that church is that people come there because it's a place where they can make friends. Mm -hmm. It's a place where they can uh, have their kids uh, feel that they, they're, they're in good company. Right. Uh, so uh, Christianity is changing. Well, and it's not all bad. It, it, I mean, we can, as a Baptist say, both of us are Baptist, I think there are things that I want to make sure Baptists historically contributed to the larger church, and we want to be able to keep holding those things up, religious liberty being one of those, the, the right and responsibility of individuals to interpret Scripture for themselves and to do so in a community uh, under the, the guidance of the Spirit. Uh, these are things that are important to us, I think, and we, we want to continue to pass on. But it does seem to me that perhaps the non-denominational churches uh, and their success are uh, a, a part of a different kind of way the Spirit is unifying the church too. Uh, helping us move away from our balkanization of denominational life and identity. So there's always a pro and a con to these things yeah. as, as there, things there move historically. And then we started this movement called the Red Letter Christians Movement. Yes, let's talk about that. Yeah. Um, the 20th century was a century in which we argued over theology. Mm -hmm. uh, there were those who questioned the virgin birth, mm -hmm. who questioned the resurrection, the mm -hmm. deity of Christ. There are these huge theological arguments, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps most dramatic in the middle of the 20th century, the fundamentalist controversy, as they called it. Right. Uh, there were these books um, put out about 1905 called The Fundamentals. There were yes. six books sent to every clergy person in the country saying, here are some fundamental beliefs that all Christians should hold to. And so a movement grew up around these books called the Fundamentalist Movement. Right. Uh, and that was the way it was mm -hmm. uh, in the uh, 20th century, arguments over doctrine. Mm -hmm. The 21st century uh, and with young people, very, very different. Mm -hmm. They're not arguing over theology. They're arguing over certain social issues. Yes. Uh, young people, for instance, are very concerned about the fact that their old, older uh, persons, the, the, uh, their parents, their, the elders in their churches, seem to be much more conservative on social issues. Mm -hmm. They may agree theologically with them, mm -hmm. but on social issues they don't. For instance, the Barna Foundation, which is perhaps the most uh, evangelical, uh, social, social conscious group. They yes. do surveys on what evangelicals believe point out that last year for the first time of young people under the age of 25, more young people under the age of 25 who call themselves evangelicals no longer are opposed to gay marriage. They support gay marriage. That's a, a big difference from those who are over the age of Absolutely. 25. So there's a, an age difference emerging. The 21st century is concerned over issues like poverty, mm -hmm. Talk to young people, what it concerns you. They're not arguing about the virgin birth. They want a Christianity that speaks to their fellow students at school mm -hmm. who are gay, mm -hmm. wants them affirmed. They want a church that talks about the environment. The environment is a big issue for young people. Older people just, it doesn't jive with them. Mm -hmm. But young people, it's very important for them. Mm -hmm. uh, they are very, very concerned about poverty. Mm -hmm. Oh, are they concerned about poverty? Mm -hmm. You can always get them to join in any effort to reach out to the poor. I, I rejoice in that mm -hmm. uh, because uh, here's the difference between the 20th century and the 21st century. Mm -hmm. As a kid growing up, every Bible study I went to was on the epistles of Paul. Yes. Paul gives us theology. Mm -hmm. Young people today don't want to deal with Paul as much as they want to deal with, here he comes, Jesus. Jesus, yes. And uh, they come to Jesus. So we talked about orthodoxy, mm -hmm. 
right beliefs in the 20th century, mm -hmm. it's the 21st century. We hear more and more this word, which is, which I had never heard before, orthopraxis. Right. You know, namely, what are your practices? Mm -hmm. Do you live the life that Jesus called us to live? Mm -hmm. uh, my students at Eastern University, where I've taught, say, you know, Gandhi was right. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what the Sermon on the Mount teaches, what Jesus taught us in the Sermon on the Mount. Everybody knows what it's about, except for Christians. <laughs> you know, I mean, can you read the Sermon on the Mount? As my colleague uh, in the Red Letter Christian Movement, Shane Claiborne says, and come to the plant part where it says, love your enemies. Right. And he has a sarcastic line that he uses. When Jesus said, love your enemies, he probably meant we shouldn't kill them. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> you know, right. you know, it's a pretty obvious thing. Right. Can you read uh, the Beatitudes where it says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy and, and still believe in capital punishment. It, it's impossible. Uh, as a matter of fact, M Shane came to me one day and said, uh, you're retired now. What are you living on? Uh, who pays you for... I said, well, you know, I put money away. and uh, Didn't Jesus say, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth oh, my where goodness. moth and rust doth corrupt? I mean, he did say that, didn't he, Tony? I said, yeah. He said, well, uh, you know, uh, what am I supposed to do? Live like the <laughs> flowers of the fields and the birds of the air? He said, that's what Jesus said to do. Uh, the question is... Uh, you read Jesus. It's scary. Right. Uh, you know, you at your church have a discipleship class. We're going to right. train people to be disciples. So what right. do you teach them? Right. Do you teach them what Jesus said a disciple is expected to do? Jesus said, here he comes from the red letters. If any man would be my disciple, right. let him sell what he has, give the money to the poor, and take up the cross and follow me. Right. That won't go over well. <laughs> uh, you can see the problem. Right. Uh, and the matter of fact, most of the young people I look to, uh, they don't look at uh, the great preachers as their models. Right. Billy Graham is not their model. Right. It's St. Francis of Assisi right. that right. is their model. And yet you, you have written a book, as I recall, uh, for, for people who are... Uh, on the way to being full disciples and, and, and giving, giving people a kind of credit for uh, making progress, you might say, uh, which, which is, I think, one of the struggles that many people in the pew have. And, uh, and there's a lot, of, a lot of folks that are doing something uh, and, and they, they, they're making progress. So. Whenever I sign a book, I always sign it Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Uh -huh. And this is what it says. Not as though I have already apprehended, not as though I have already re arrived, but I'm pressing towards the mark right. of the high calling of God right. in Christ Jesus our Lord. Right. It's not quite as simple yes. as living out the Sermon on the Mount. Right. It's not, I mean, Jesus wasn't married. He didn't have a wife and kids to worry about. Right. No, that makes a difference. It does. That's not just my belief. Right. Paul in the seventh chapter of 1 Corinthians says, if you really want to be a follower of Jesus, it's better if you don't marry at all. Right. Because then you're going to be torn between taking care of your wife and family and being totally committed to doing the work of Christ's kingdom. Mm -hmm. He's right. Yes. So I'm ambiguous. Right. I'm striving. Uh, and uh, whenever anybody asks me about this, I always point out that I'm Baptist and we believe we're saved by grace. Mm -hmm. That is, it's unmerited favor. Yes. It's something we don't deserve. And so my salvation is not contingent upon how fully I have lived up to the red letters of the Bible. I'm trying. Mm -hmm. I'm trying, but I, I'm not there. My salvation is dependent on what Jesus did for me on the cross and in his resurrection. That's where my, somebody says, are you, a, are you saved? My answer is, Yes, I'm saved because of what Jesus did for me. Well, then you're a Christian. No, I'm not. Right. I'm with Soren Kierkegaard who says, if you mean by Christian, somebody who lives out the teachings of Jesus, I'm not there yet. I'm moving in that direction. 
Well, I think that's a beautiful encouragement to us because we're all of us on the way yeah. uh, in some sense. And that's what the early Christians called themselves. They didn't call themselves Christians. The way. That was something that was given in mockery of them right. uh, when they were called Christians at, right. in the city of Antioch. Mm -hmm. They called themselves people who were on the way. The way. Yeah. Well, well, we're on the way to another episode with you, and I'm looking forward to another conversation. Thank you for this time together, Tony. Thanks for being with me. Terrific. Good God salutes the vital services provided to our community by the North Texas Food Bank. Each day, the North Texas Food Bank Feeding Network provides access to more than 190,000 meals for hungry children, seniors, and families. Visit ntfb.org to get involved.